You know, I was saved out of the rock and all that kind of stuff. And then God set me on the drums that says to worship. And, and uh, because of the COVID and everything, we do have a band, but everybody's straggling us. So God's gathering us back together and the timing will be right. We'll have it together. And our, our friend Scott, he's playing and it practicing. I don't, I'm not trying to make, force you to do anything, brother, because the blessings of God leads us to blessings, amen, it doesn't add no sorrow, and so I just want to share, this is going to be a great, fun little lesson that we're going to do today, and how many here, how many here remember some of the good things of your dad, if, if you can remember, and if your dad's still living, don't remind him about it, you know, my father was a wonderful man, I was fortunate those of you that met my parents, to have a good mom and a good dad. They weren't saved. They didn't follow Jesus per se, but they raised me, because my nephew's here, they raised me morally right. In other words, they believed in none of this weird stuff, morally to basically do right. Now, when I came to know the Lord, my dad had this first statement with me. He says, Dad, guess what happened to me? And he says, what happened to you now? What's it going to cost me, you know? I says, Dad, I got saved. And he looks at me, and he's, he does one of these pondering things. Ah. And then he comes up with this really wild statement. I love my dad, Father's Day, you know. He says, son, at least now when you talk, I'm going to believe you. <laughs> that was one of the things. And then I said to him later on that day, I said, Dad, how come we don't pray over the meals? He said, we pray over the meals. We hadn't prayed over the meals unless somebody who prays over the meals come. We've never prayed over the meals. Now, this is before I'm saved, and I just got saved. My dad used to say things like, and maybe you remember this. He would look at me, he says, son, do you hear me? And I'd look up, and I'd be thinking. i try to hold these thoughts back. I would be thinking, everybody can hear you. <laughs> You're yelling. <laughs> Amen. Then he would say something like this, who do you think you are? I said, Dad, if you don't know by now, I'm not going to tell you. Amen. How many of you, know? I love my father. My father's in heaven. I told him today in prayer. Now, please don't, don't think any wrong of me. I always say, God, if my parents are listening, tell my dad, happy Father's Day. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Now, there's something wrong if you have something come visit you that already has gone on and supposedly says, I'm your father or grandfather or grandmother. That isn't. That's the demon, okay? All right, so if you've ever had that happen, just rebuke and say, out of here, pal. Now, amen. So you ready? We've been doing a series called The Truth About. And this one here is the truth about our mind. Now, I threw on the word crazy mind, but, but really we don't have a crazy mind, but the enemy would like to sell us on a crazy mind. Hello. The enemy doesn't think clearly. He, his suggestions are anti-God, anti-respect for one another. And so when the enemy attacks, just let me tell you this, he attacks not your body. That's not the big threat. He doesn't attack your spirit. If you've got God in your spirit, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, then he can attack your spirit. But the biggest area that the enemy loves to attack in a human being is their mind. Yeah. Hello. And I'll tell you why. We'll go through it, and then I'll show you what you could do about it. Can you say amen? So welcome to the briefing. I sure appreciate it. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at the first two verses in Romans chapter 12. Now, the point I'm going to make here is, in the Scripture, God wants you to understand what the Scripture is saying to you. The Scripture could be saying to you, you do something with your body. Or the Scripture could be saying to you, you take your spirit and worship me. Or the scripture could be saying, your soul needs refreshing. And the reason why I brought it up like that, because when you go to Romans, how many get Romans 12 already? 
When you're in Romans chapter 12, all three are going to be mentioned because man, mankind, each man or woman is a spirit being. Everyone say spirit. We have a soul. Say, I have a soul. And I live in a body. Everyone say, I live in a body. All right. So according to scripture, I'm going to define things. And the reason why I define things is to help us understand where we're at with God, how to understand and relate the scripture so that we don't run on and be religious, blaming God for things he can't do, and then blessing the devil because you think it's God. Remember, when Jesus went into his own hometown and he came in to do miracles, hardly any miracles could happen because they didn't see Jesus as a Messiah, as a miracle worker. They saw him as Joseph's son, the little carpenter boy. How do you look at God? Has Satan convinced you that God is the one that's causing everybody the problems in the earth? That's one of his lies. That God giveth and the Lord taketh away. Remember, Satan sows lies to discourage our faith and trust in a perfect God. How many here believe God is perfect? So he can't make a mistake concerning you. So the mistakes come from two sources. Everyone go to. The mistakes that we make come from the suggestions of the enemy. And maybe the suggestions of our flesh and others. Can you say amen? That is why, everyone say, I'll get this. Every time you get up in the morning, who do we meet with? We want to meet with God so he can write and tune us up. Can you say amen? And every thought that we think, we need to line it up with the word. Did you know if you dwell on something long enough, you'll go after it? Sure. Sure. If I talk to you about a peanut butter barfay, maybe, maybe a chocolate sundae, ooh, and all the trimmings, what happens, the way we're made up is, well, you might hate ice cream, so who, you, know, you don't count. But you're dwelling on something, and as long as you're dwelling on it, ooh, it's looking good, it's not bad, it's like ice cream. And then as you dwell on it, then you start talking about it. Oh, man, wouldn't a nice, cool ice cream be good this afternoon? Right yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. No, I'm just trying to show you how your mind works. Is all I'm doing is showing you how your mind works. So, so you got a thought. You dwell on it long enough. Now you're talking about it. And if somebody happens along, whoa, man, I'm, I'm really hungry for some ice cream, you know? you know. And next thing you know, you find your feet following through. Well, that's how the devil works. He suggests that you are never going to make it to anything. God is all the problems, and we, then we dwell on it. We don't take that suggestion and go to the scripture with it. We start dwelling on it like ice cream. And then we start, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how we're going to do it. And then we're starting to walk around like that. So we need to know a little bit more about it our mind. And if I do some crazy things up here, you'll forgive me, right? Okay. Like, faith. I mean, I have some, my daughter and her husband watches all the time, and she, she must really have to pray. Oh, Dad, here we go. So, catch this. I beseech you, Paul says, therefore, by the mercies of God. How many know God's merciful? How many times have he forgiven you? You went and blown it, blown it, blown it, and he still loves you. Amen. Don't ever forget that. And he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. See the two? You, whoever that is, I'll clarify in a minute, present your body. The you is the real you, your spirit man. Everyone say, my spirit man is in charge with Jesus. My body is not. So if you... If you're like any other human being, your body will periodically have a little tantrum. We'll talk about your, your body sometime, your earth suit, okay? What it does, what it shouldn't do. 
but your body isn't the real you. It's a machine, really. It's wonderfully and fearfully made. It's made out of molecules and all. God put it all together out of the dust of the ground, breathe life into it. Can you say amen? But this is not the real you. So don't spend a lot of time investing in it. Someone look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. We work hard, we go to the club, we work out, we're doing all this kind of stuff, and then the whole scripture says, it's, it's okay to be in shape and all that kind of stuff, but it's only profits very little. Why? Because you're going to shed this cocoon. You're going to get rid of this body. The body is corrupt. The blood in it is corrupt, makes you sick. Your flesh has a curse in it, makes you get old and, and break down. So aren't you glad you're leaving it? Yes. Yes. Said, so, well, I, I never read that in my Bible. Well, read your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says this will be swallowed up in life, that this corruption will put on incorruption, and death will be swallowed up. Yes. Yes. That's you. Amen. So don't run around with your feelings. Don't be more than fats fleshy feelings that thinks about themselves. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've been so filled with the Spirit for the last couple of weeks in my prayer time that I, I don't know. Don't invite me to Scott's birthday party, you know. Anyway, so let's go into this. It says that you present your body a living sacrifice which is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, that phrase means it is what's required for you to be success. How many know that if you're going to go on a train ride, you've got to purchase a ticket? Hello? And so it says you've got to learn to lay your body at the altar in such a way that you can become a success. It's what's reasonably required of you because it's the thing that causes us a lot of problems is our flesh. The Bible says to be carnally, our fleshly minded is death. So let's go on. It goes on then. And he says, and do not be conformed to this world. The word conform means pressed into its mold. The world is trying to shove you into its mold. And you're doing your best not to fit in. Can you say Amen. Come on, remember the days you used to fit in bell bottoms? You know, back in my day, they had what they call ratting their hair. They were ratted up into a big puff ball. Thank God they don't get near a match. You know, trends and, and, and things like that. But you know, Christians, we follow Jesus, not a trend. Amen. We follow Jesus, not what's the latest heavy ribby. Come on, say amen. Now watch this. And it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured, transformed, renewed like a butterfly out of a cocoon amen. by the renewing of your mind. There's that mind. Renewing of your mind. So let me explain. Your flesh is just simply a machine, wonderfully and fearfully godly made, that's supposed to obey your soul and your spirit. Can you say amen? So your spirit is you. It looks just like me if it leaped out of my body. It's got God in it now. I'm a new creature. My soul is what we're going to look at today. My soul is a, a bunch of parts that will help you understand. Again, I define things for understanding. So everyone say, I want to know what the soul is. How many here for the re saving of the soul, right? Saving of the soul. The soul is not your spirit. Your soul is part of you, the other part of you. I got to go through this real quick. So your soul is this. Simply, if you can't write it down quick enough, just see if you can review this, okay? Your soul is your mind, your will your emotions, your drives, or we call them appetites. How many here know some people like to draw? Some people like to play music? 
Some people, poetry, and some people work, and they do like to do certain things that, that cause you to want to do certain projects, and others not. Those are the drives that God put in you. They're all right. They kind of lead you and, and your appetites into God's will for your life. And then your personality. How many here know that you got quite a personality? Amen. And your will. So it's your, let's see if I can get this again. It is your mind, your will, your emotions, your drives, your appetites, your intellect, and your personality. Whew. Sometimes I stop too long there, and I just need to rattle right on through it. So, everyone say, my mind. Yeah. Okay. Your mind is a very unique thing. Okay? So, I'm going to define it according to Scripture very sim simply, okay? We know that there's all kinds of frontal lobes and all these other things, and who knows, somebody sneak in a lower lobotomy. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to divide the mind up just so you can simply understand it. Everyone say conscious mind, subconscious mind. Okay, conscious mind is what you are aware of at this moment. You're conscious of it. Now, you don't have to repeat that stuff. Second thing is your subconscious mind is your dreams, your visions, your memories. Good or bad? Okay. All right. So, how many has ever been walking along and then suddenly see something or hear something that brings up a memory? And you go, deja vu. That's not a, it's not a deja vu. It's just something that matches your soul. Something in your subconscious mind that's been planted there ever since you're a little wee kid. Can you say amen? Now, whether you know this or not, but in your subconscious mind, some of us still have some junk. All right, don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> we have junk. So in order to get the junk out, bad memories, things that we that hurt. Some people are, are responsive. In other words, if somebody walks in the room that hurt them, they'll still respond because of the subconscious mind says, danger, 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 you see. So we need to know what we're conscious of. How many know we should focus on God? We should be more conscious of God than ourselves. Say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, more of God, less of you. Smile when you say it. More of God, less of you. Well, that's really what it is. Less of us, we want more of God. Can you say amen? So we have a conscious mind, a subconscious mind. Amen. Are you still with me? Amen. Now, besides that, our mind is unique. Women have a different kind of mind than men do. Amen. <laughs> There's a book out called, was it Women Are From... Mars and men are from Venus. I can't remember how it goes. And then some of you guys, you need to look up your love languages to find out what your partner really actually likes because we have this terrible tendency to bless our partner with things that we like. Honey, how do you like the new lawnmower? <laughs> anyway, so, so let me just talk about the women's mind versus the men's mind for fun, okay? First of all, the men's mind are more calculated as far as they look at things in boxes, in categories, and concentrate. They're able to concentrate and get something done. While the women on the other hand, none of these are wrong. They're just, I'm just describing it. Women on the other hand, they're, they're, their head's like spaghetti. It's kind of like wires. Now, it sounds like I'm putting them down, but I'm not. They're able to take a one, two, three, four, what the kid's doing at the same time. They're planning the lunches. Now, the problem is, ladies, especially when you have something very important to tell your husband, your husband has concentration modes. A husband is concentrating on a project. He's not listening to you, although he's saying, yes, dear. But he's focusing on that project. That is not the time. 
to say anything of importance to the man while he's concentrating. Because you'll say, yes, dear, yes, dear. And then when he's done with the project, you sit down with him, you say, remember what we talked about? Huh? <laughs> you wait till he's not concentrating, it's sitting down. Guys, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's when the woman asks you, she says, well, what you been doing all day? How'd it go? Well, nothing. You know? And that's what they mean. Not a whole lot. Everything concentrated. We got it all done. But when you ask a woman, how's everything, dear? Oh, nothing. You better clear the room. Because their mind going, zzz, 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 zzz. hello? And we're concentrating. Now, one thing us guys have that the ladies don't have, although I have my suspicions, we have the empty box, the empty space. You know, that's when we sit on the couch and go click, 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 click. We're really not watching anything. We're in our empty space. And that is another time, ladies. Do not talk to the man in his empty space. It just wait till you can pull him out of the empty space. Because he's again in his empty space. Well, what you thinking about, dear? Nothing. And literally, they're not thinking about anything. Leave him alone. <laughs> All right, so you can see our mind can be really kind of silly at some times, right? But see, the enemy also knows. So let's go and give you a little history. Back in the beginning of Genesis, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says that their eyes were open. We know that not only their eyes were open, but the Hebrew says their brain became open and Satan can suggest thoughts. Hello. And so this is the area that I want to talk to you about. Now, how many's ever injured your knee? What'd that do for the rest of your legs and your performance? It kind of set you aside, didn't it? How many's ever popped your elbow out of joint? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And your soul, that part of your soul that's your mind, is a coupler like your elbow and your knee. Hello. So Satan attacks the mind because he knows if he can pop your mind off a sink of Jesus and into worry, you'll become dysfunctional. Anybody will let you know if you're an athlete or anything, if you pop your elbow out, your knee out, you're out of the game. You could be out for quite some time. So Satan goes for the brain, goes for your mind, and begins to suggest all the time, all the time, all the time. Now, if you did what I did, please don't. Every time I get a negative thought, I'd be thinking about my children and about how wonderful God is, and this creepy thought would just come creeping right on through. Yeah. Ah! Sin. Now remember, old Snaggletooth shoots thoughts <laughs> like a spit wad. And it goes shooting right on through there. Listen, there's a great way for you to figure out what's coming through your brain. If it lines up with scripture, if it gives you a benefit of loving God more, good. Caring for others, good. But if it tells you people don't like you there at the church, pastor kept looking at you when he was preaching. You said, you need to cast those imaginations down. You need to recognize Satan is doing that to play with you. Now, let me suggest this, that you understand this. Every time something good's going to happen to you, Satan's going to suggest something bad before it happens. He's going to say, don't go to church today. You know, that's the day you run to church because God has something special for you. If Satan's telling you not to do something, why would he be telling you that? Amen. Hello? He's a liar. He's a bully. If he tells you you're not healed and you ask for God to heal you, you should get up and say, I don't care, creep, what you say. The Bible says by his stripes, I was healed, not I'm going to be healed. And you start claiming it and praising God for it, and it'll manifest in your body. That's for somebody today, for today. 
Amen. It will manifest. Stop dwelling on it. Why, why, why? How come, how come, how come? Oh, what if, what if, what if? Shut up! <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. Really, that's how our mind works. So what do we do, Pastor Kerry? I'm glad you, you asked me that question. You ready? Let's go into this. What? We got 15 minutes. Let's go through this. All right, so a couple of things I want you to remember. Remember, man is a three-part being. What are we? Spirit, soul, and which part does the enemy attack? He attacks your mind. Your body is a subject to your mind in him. If your mind is out of sync, you'll find your body will go out of sync too. If your mind's out of sync, your spirit isn't affected other than shut down from influencing. Everyone say soul. soul. Your spirit, and this is how it works, your spirit has God in it, right? So if my soul is my mind, then my spirit should influence my mind, not people or the enemy. My spirit, who has God in it, should influence my mind from the eyes of my understanding being light. What else? Mind, will. Everyone say will. You have a will. It's kind of like a, 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 the old western doors that swing out and swing in. How many seen the double doors swing out, swing in? Some big bully comes in with the six guns. are going to, you know. That's your will. Your will is willing to let out from your spirit. And your will is willing to let in. Your eye, your ear, your nose, your mouth, your touching, all are channels to the will. The will gate. And so a truth was presented to you, and you can either accept that as biblical truth, or you can reject that and keep the door closed. Can you say amen? You have control of your mind. Not the devil. You do. Don't let it wander away from you. Hello? You know, I like, I like to meditate on things. I like to dwell on things, but I do not dwell on the negative because when my mind starts reaching for understanding, Satan's right there to throw some understanding. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own This is, this is where we lose. Satan's a master at thinking and, and reasoning, okay? You are not. You are a baby. So the time you get to think and you're smart is the time that everything else shows you you're not. Huh? Remember? You turned into a teenager and mom and dad grew stupid. And they're looking at you like you fell out of a tree. And you're looking at them like, what happened? Did you drink some silly water or something? What that is is because when we reach the teenager part in us, God puts a go juice for us to learn and absorb. And we're not careful. Satan's right there for us to learn and absorb the wrong things. That's why parents are to raise their children biblically. And of course, look at the mess we got. So many of us come later to the Lord and we get straightened up later. Can you say amen? But I got to get you to come on such a regular basis I can reprogram you. Not the way I think, but the way God wants you to think. Can you say amen? How many know God can already brief you, Denise, for tomorrow? So that when tomorrow comes, you're at rest. Moving right along. Also, too, today... We're going to focus on how to straighten out our thinking. All right, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. How many like the tale of two brains? Yeah. We do have a video out on that. It's really, really good about uh, dating and husband and, you know, marriages and all. And that's borrowed from some of that, so... All right, 2 Corinthians 10, look at verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh. Now, remember, you live in a body, don't you? So if you want to go for a walk, you have to take your body along. <laughs> so although we walk in the flesh, listen, 
We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal means earthly or natural. But mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Everyone say strongholds. I'm going to quickly say this. When you were young, the enemy put little strongholds in your thinking. Maybe some of your friends did too. And whenever that little stronghold is set, you do things. Kind of like the little two-year-old that loves to see mom jump around when he sits in the high chair, got the bowl full of porridge, and he goes, I love mom moving around like that. So he flips it out onto the floor because he loves his mom moving around like that. Well, doesn't the kid understand the value of porridge? No, the kid is entertained by his mom jumping around cleaning up the mess. And that's how the devil looks at you. He suggests you to your mind and sees what you're going to do. It's a temptation. He suggests to you, why don't you try another church? And it's at the right time when you needed to hear what was going to be at that church. Why don't you do this? After all, the girl doesn't like you. You think she does. Blah, 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 blah. You, what you need to do is recognize Anytime there's a challenge of you advancing and having a relationship with God, you know it doesn't come from the Lord. Hello. So you want to discern your strongholds. How many here found it on God? You're standing on the rock. You shall not be moved. But there's strongholds like alcoholism runs in your family. And so... As hard as you tried, you find you're slipping off drinking a little. This is just a common thing. I'm not picking on any of us, okay? That's what I was told. I come from Scotland. We're drunks. Hello. I'm picking on myself. And so we control a big part of Scotland. You can look us up. Last name is Oliphant. We're the Oliphants. We had our castles and our our kilts and our bagpipes and we did all that and guess what we were just the biggest jerks and they kicked us out and sent us to America <laughs> hello but because I'm Scottish the, the lie is oh it's the generational curse how many's heard that one okay let me tell you the Bible says when you receive Jesus you're redeemed from the curse so Curses do not follow you from your forefathers like the Old Testament. What follows from our forefathers, if it's a drinking problem, okay, let me just talk to you, I'm just talking to you. If like alcohol is a problem in the family, okay, that's a spirit. It's not a curse that came, it's a familiar spirit that corrupted the family is now going for the grandkids. Folks, wake up. Especially you Pentecostals. You got to be the most powerless people I know. Hello? Because we're all noise, no power. Hello? What do you mean? Hey, a piece of dynamite has power in it, doesn't it? Yeah. But if you just throw it on top of the road, it's going to just make a big bang. But if you take it and you put it in the right spot, you can blow up a stump. You can move some things for making a dam. Using the right tool for the right thing. Can you say, man, we lost it, church. We got a bag of rocks we're practicing instead of the truths of Jesus Christ. And so if that shoe doesn't fit, you say, man, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that now. All right, so. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are mighty few God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then casting down imaginations. How many has ever dwelt on some, something long enough and you just found yourself just upset? That's an imagination that shouldn't control you. Somebody said to me, you bought these five acres. It cost you a half a million dollars. Who's going to pay for that? I said, God. Certainly not the church. We're too small. 
And you know what has happened? God, but who do you think's given me those lies? Hoping that I'm going to worry. Hoping that I'm going to do this and do that. What is he hitting? He's hitting my mind. He's trying to get me disconnected. So if he whacks it hard enough and I dwell on it long enough, I'm ineffective in my walk with Jesus. And we don't want you to be ineffective. Can you say amen? So he pops in the head with something negative and see if whether you're going to react or respond. So go with me to Hebrews chapter 4. I'll try to get you through this in five minutes. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us what the word does. Say the word of God. Say it again. The word of God. Now, folks, this is what we need to do, whether you do this or not. That Bible in your lap is God in written form. Hello. Some of you are looking at me. You thought it was a book. That Bible has an old covenant and a new covenant and you have the Holy Spirit will show you what you're part of that covenant. So when you pick up that Bible, you're picking up God. So don't be disrespectful when it comes to the word. My dad told me two things that I would promise him to never do. Of course, when I was a smart aleck, I said, what are they, dad? He says, number one, never get a tattoo. Sorry, guys. Because in his eyes, when you had a tattoo back then, you were a hoodlum. But it's not that way anymore, so just throw that away. But this is the one that really meant something to me. He says, and number two, never make fun of God or those that love him. Amen. He said it this way, never put down others that love you. Never put down others that love you. It's easy to do. Satan goes, oh, yeah, he doesn't love you anymore. So, and that's not true. Like for me, if you say, I want you to be my friend, I'll be your friend. Even if you have a gun in your hand, you're going to put it up to my head. That's an extreme. When I say I'm going to be your friend, it isn't based on your performance, folks. It's based on you asked me to be your friend. The same thing works with God. Don't we ask him to be our friend? So he's, no matter what you do, he's not going to not be your friend. So let's start being friends with him. That means you got to show God respect. That means you got to care enough to be wanting to be with him. Say, oh me, somebody. So let us therefore be diligent. This is Hebrews 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone should come short as a bad example. Let me explain. What does the Bible say? Jesus says, come unto me all you that labor and I will give you rest. So there's a rest for people of God, but they won't find it. They'll be religious, but they won't make peace with God. And that peace with God, you have to do every day because your body always wants to do its own thing. So you meet with God, so he tunes you up, and you find your rest for the day, and then you could be as busy as you want, but you'll be at rest with Jesus during that busyness. Are you with me? So it reads this way. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into the rest, lest anyone fall short of the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living, say living, and powerful, powerful. Now, I'm going to read the rest. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing between soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the tents of the heart. We'll finish up with this one because we're running out of time. But let me show you. When we get into the word of God, it divides us up. As we read the word of God, it lets you know what is your flesh, and how you're to lay it at the altar as a living sacrifice. What is your soul? How it relates to the scripture? What to do with it? What not to do with it? And how it relates to your spirit? Can you say amen? All right, so this is really exciting. So when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, God, the God of rest, comes into our heart. Let me point something out that will help you. Okay. Everything in the Old Testament was a type and shadow 
of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So when you read about the tabernacle that moved in the wilderness, the tabernacle is Jesus. Why? Because we live and move and have our being in him. Amen. The candlesticks made out of gold, pounded out of one piece of metal, is dealing with Christ and all of the personality that ministers to Christ as a focal point. And we can look at the word Sabbath. Everyone say Sabbath. Have you ever been nailed by somebody who believes that if you don't worship on a Saturday, you're not going to heaven? Raise your hands. Duh, how stupid. Since when does God exalt a day above him? Don't throw me out. Saturday is the Hebrew Sabbath. God gave the Sabbath to them so they wouldn't kill themselves and work themselves to death. He says, put the Sabbath, make the Sabbath holy. The word holy means set it apart. Always as a reminder, don't kill yourself by working. Put me on your mind on the Sabbath. How many know that that's a type and shadow? Because it isn't a day, is it? Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you what? Rest. So who's our rest? Jesus. He's our Sabbath. So in the Old Testament, it says, honor the Sabbath. It's talking about when Jesus comes, honor him. Amen. He's your day of rest. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm resting in Christ. I don't have to wait till Saturday. You see how religious Satan makes us? Oh, you got to be wave the flags and do all the rituals. And yet it's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? All right. I'm, I didn't want to make you think I'm putting anyone down, but I want to tell you something. We have our Sabbath every day. His name is Jesus. Every day. Every day we have God. We're loved by God. We're cared by God. We're nurtured by God, and yet our brain needs some help. All right, you with me? So it pierces and divides the center between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God lets you know what is of your spirit, okay? That's your morrow. Everyone say morrow. It's a type, okay? Morrow is what produces the life in the blood in your body, in the bone. It's your morrow, okay? And everyone say joint. joint. So your spirit is your morrow, and your soul is your joint. So don't smoke it, all right? <laughs> Amen. So, so your spirit has the life, and your joint, your soul is what couples and projects that light onto your flesh. So your spirit has God in it. Your soul needs to be focused because the enemy is trying to buffet it. So the more focused you are on Christ, the more your walk becomes stable and the more less stress and more success you come because you're not pulled away by the suggestions of the enemy. Remember, everyone's tempted when he's drawn away from God, okay, into your own thing. You're still with me? So the word of God divides asunder. It separates your spirit, your soul, and your body. Amen. With your spirit, you reach God. With your soul, you reach others. And with your body, you communicate on the plane of the earth. So, I'm not trying to make it really tough, but Satan so goes right to the joint and tells you you're nothing, you're no good. Remember, it's like when you make a mistake, how you run yourself down. Come on, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you know, oh, you're not but stupid. Who just throwing that stuff in your brain? Who told you you were stupid? Do you think God tells you you're stupid? No. So, you're beginning to understand that this thing needs to be soaked into the word and into God so it will not receive the voice of a stranger. Are you with me? So we take the word of God, it separates what comes out of our spirit, 
It helps straighten out our soul so it doesn't get disjointed and we can continue to walk. And it helps our body to become subjective like a sacrifice. How many know it'd be really a terrible thing, and I'm, and I'm break it right here. If you said to your hand, hand, grab that pin. Now you're not gonna say it out loud. Hand, grab that pin. But you, you, know, you in your mind, you control your body, right? Well, what would you do if you said, okay, let's get that pin, and your hand didn't move? You would say there's something wrong with your mind. I'll just share this. My mom died of Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig's disease is when you have your full mind, but the motor part in your mind can't get your fingers and your legs, and, and finally your heart goes and your chest goes. And yet I had a mom that was super intelligent. She taught in high school. She taught my Sunday school. She ran and all these things. Some of you remember but yet she couldn't function because her mind was disjointed from her body. And the reason I'm bringing it up is it's a mean disease. And diseases don't come from God. They came from Adam because he fell. And we're given these diseases because of a fallen nature in our flesh. So we walk with God as best we can so he keeps us healthy. Can you say amen? And so we want our mind being able to be servitude to our spirit. Amen. Amen. How many here would like to think better thoughts? Amen. We're going to show you how. How many here would like to look at people and see the good in them? Yes. Amen. So here's what you need to do. Say, this is what I need to do. I go to God and I ask him to change my thinking to agree with my spirit and not to listen to the world's suggestions or the negativity of the enemy. Can you remember those words? See, remember when you pray, you're like painting a picture. So you don't want to throw a piece of blob on the screen and say, God, this is how I feel. Blap! <laughs> You say, God, and you describe with your words the things that you said in your word and the things you have for me and the things that you need in your life. So, Lord, you know my mind needs help. So I'm inviting you to help it. Now, here's the key. God does not push his way into your life. You have to ask him. So think about it. Well, God, how come you're not working with my job? And it just seems like everything is going awry. Did you ask God to get in there and work? Well, no. He's too busy. So sometimes it's just not asking God when we, we can. Can you say amen? Remember, God set himself up through invitation. Now listen, Satan got this planet from Adam. Jesus came and took it back at the resurrection, but then set himself up this way. Okay, he says, the only way a person can get out of this sinful nature is to ask me. Because you'll notice if you're saved, God didn't jump down on you, kick you in the head, throw you on the street and get you saved. You had to what? You had to ask. And the Bible says ask. Always keep asking. Asking. Now you're thinking, well, if I do that, I'm going to sound real selfish. No. If you ask in the right way, it pleases God. Because he is more than willing to help us. Amen. But if we never ask him to, Amen. that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If you know to get saved and you never asked him to save you, you can't get saved. If you don't ask God to help you with your thinking, help you with your walk on a daily basis, 
You're going to become like so many Christians, and you're just struggling and singing this song. You know what this song is? Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Look who's in office. <laughs> the idea is, if Satan's in the office, our lives are full of confusion. If we listen to God and we meet with him on a regular basis, blessed are those that diligently seek him. Final scripture is, don't worry about anything, but in all things through prayer and supplication, petitioning, make your requests known to God, why he needs to hear you ask. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, verse 8, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is just, whatever is a good report, think on these things. In other words, discipline your mind not to dwell negative stuff. Get some out of that this morning. What are you going to do? You're going to become doers of the word. Give the Lord a praise, will you?